Is the American century over? That's the question posed by author Joseph Nye in his new book of the same title. Whether framed as a U.S. decline or the rise of the rest, there is no doubt that the global landscape is changing and that all nations, including the United States, must adapt. Nye discussed his analysis with Wilson Center President Jane Harmon during a recent visit to the center. That's the focus of this edition of Rewind. You remember the term American century was coined by Henry Luce in 1941, and he used it to try to get the United States involved in World War II. Uh, after World War I, the United States was the most powerful country in the world, but it didn't live up to that. We retreated into isolationism and did not become central to the global balance of power. There are polls that show that a, something like nearly half of the American people think that China has already or will soon pass the United States. And there are books that are written about the Chinese century, meaning the 21st century. And uh, one of them uh, by a British author, Martin Jock, has a revealing title. It's called When China Rules the World. Uh, if you look at R&D and the technologies of this century, biotechnology, nanotechnology, the next generation of information technology, uh, the U.S. is generally at the forefront of all of these. Uh, people say, oh, well, look, uh, my colleague Graham Allison just testified before Congress said, look, China outranks us in patents. Doesn't matter. If you look at those patents, they're not serious patents. But if you look at the, where the leadership is, on these uh, technologies, it really still remains U.S. The interesting thing is, what does that mean? One way to say it is, well, we're being passed by China or by somebody else. The other way to say it is, no, it's really the rise of the rest. It's not just China, it's India, Brazil, Indonesia, many other countries. And in that rise of the rest, there's a different problem for the U.S. leadership than the problem of China. So getting an accurate assessment of what power relations are like and having the confidence to say that, no, the American century is not over, but we're going to have to adjust to a different world where there's going to be a problem of entropy as opposed to just a rivalry with China, that, I think, is, uh, is the answer. So a smart policy decision would have had the self-confidence to say, yes, bring China into these production of global public goods, don't worry so much about China overcoming us. That's not the problem. The problem is how are we going to get work done? And that's going to take a rethinking of how we look at the point of the American century. It's not over, but it's going to be very different from what it was when Henry Luce first talked about it. Madeleine Albright uh, continues to call uh, the United States the indispensable power. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane's amendment to that is, how about calling the United States the indispensable power? partner. What do you think about partnership as a strategy now in the world? It's obviously what uh, President Obama's trying to do in this mess called the Middle East, uh, build a, a coalition of the willing and have partnerships with other countries who, are, uh, uh, who agree to share the burden of bringing some order. I think the, the, the trouble with indispensable power is that it, it, it tends to put people's backs up a bit indispensable partner, I think, is right. And you can justify it on uh, a, a theory called collective goods theory, which says that when you have a public good or collective good, if the largest uh, potential consumer doesn't help pr to produce it, nobody else will. If you're a large country, uh, if you don't produce the public good, whether that be stability or monetary uh, stability or dealing with climate change or whatever, uh, nobody else is going to be able to do it. So in that sense, the U.S. does remain indispensable because it remains the largest. But what we've got to learn is that uh, as China uh, becomes closer to us in power, uh, we've got to get them involved in helping to produce those global public goods. There is a positive sum game here. Mm -hmm. It's not all a zero sum game. Right. And if we think about that, and we think about why friends matter, uh, we can enhance our power by being friends with these rising powers rather than diminish our no. power. When you think about cyber or you think about the global economy or you think about terrorism, 
None of those things uh, respects national borders. And so my question is, is it even relevant to talk about the American century or a century named after a country, given the, the ways in which our world uh, no longer respects national boundaries? I think it, in some ways we're going to outgrow the American century in the sense that uh, <laughs> these transnational factors are going to be beyond any one set of boundaries. But the point, the reason for still using the term American uh, is your indispensable partner. If the, the U.S. doesn't take the lead, the others don't. I think, it, I think it's not going to be an American century in, a, in the way Henry Luce thought about it. But it is going to require Americans to, uh, to take a lead. And that's going to mean we're going to have to give up what I call American exemptionalism. I mean, pe people talk of American exceptionalism. Uh, we also like to give ourselves exemptions. For more information on this and a wide range of vital international topics, visit wilsoncenter.org.